Good morning, this is Sylvian Greensword. I am here interviewing Chanel Alexander. Today is April the 30th, the year is 2021. And this interview is uh, part of the oral history project for the Race and Reconciliation Initiative. Chanel, thank you for joining us this morning and for taking part in the oral history project with us. Thank you, happy to be here. <laughs> All right. So let's get right to it. Uh, can you tell us about your childhood? Tell us about where you're from, how you grew up, and uh, all that nice stuff. For sure. Um, so I born and raised in LA, Los Angeles, California. Um, my dad is Jamaican. My mom is American. Um, so first generation-ish um, American. Um, but yeah, I grew up pretty, pretty good. No, no real crazy things until I got a little bit older um but I grew up in like a kind of not so great area until I was about five years old and then we moved into a home um in Baldwin Hills area um and then that's kind of where I grew up for until college um but yeah pretty good childhood went to school everything like that um things did change in high school when my dad um went to prison so my mom became a single parent and that that's kind of what it was. Um, and that was very difficult, of course, going through high schools are like very important years um, to like not have your dad around, but I mean, got through it. Um, but yeah, other than that, I don't, I don't, there wasn't really anything else really super interesting, um, pretty basic, you know, play torts, things like that, danced, all of that. But yeah, that was my childhood. So, so tell me, um, as you grew up in California, were you surrounded by other African-American children or did you grow up in a multiracial environment? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so when I first started school, I was more local to my area. So I was mostly around black kids, a um, couple Hispanics, not a ton, but you know, basically people of color. Um, when I went to middle school, I went to a school, Paul Revere in Brentwood, California, which is a predominantly affluent white area. Um, so that's when I kind of got exposed to a lot of different people. Um, I'm pretty sure the school was predominantly white. Mm -hmm. um, there, it was like separated and sectioned off. Of course, oh. at the time, you don't really look at things like that. Um, mm -hmm. It was very cliquish and um the black people hung out with the black people, the white kids hung out with the white kids, and that's kind of how it was. Um, of course, I mean, you interact with them, but for the most part, when you look around during nutrition and lunch, you see people in their own groups. Mm -hmm. um, and then in high school, I went to a school that was pretty balanced in terms of race. So um, I believe it was like 30% black, 30% Hispanic, 30% white. Um, and then, you know, the 1% minority or well, that doesn't make any sense, 10% minority, so um, Native American, things like that. Um, but it was it was pretty mixed. But yeah. even though I did, again, interact with people, um, they literally used to call parks of campus. So Disneyland was where like the white kids hung out. Oh, Six Disneyland. Flags where, yeah, Six Flags is where the black kids hung out. Um, I forget where they call it, where the Hispanics hung out. I want to say Knott's Berry Farm. And then there was like, in the cafeteria just kind of mixed up, but mostly just like Hispanics for the most part, but it was it was pretty separated again. And I remember um, my senior or 11th grade year of high school, I had a friend, um, she was white. She formed a group cultural integration club so that we can kind of bridge that gap and um, be one um, where basically we would sit and we would have lunch together and it would be white kids, black kids, anyone who wanted to come. And we would just kind of talk and share our experiences and things like that, which I think was very helpful. Um, and it, it did kind of take away from the fact that we were so divided, I guess, mm -hmm. without even noticing it. But um, yeah, that that that's kind of where I got my exposure to um, people who didn't look like me and mm -hmm. kind of just had to go with it and accept it. Now, you mentioned your father being in prison. Uh, was there any stigma 
in the term of, uh, I assume your father was, was black because you told me he was Jamaican, he's Jamaican. Mm -hmm. So was there any stigma in terms of, oh, you know, black men go into prison and you being, um, you know, part of a, a single parent household? Yeah, so I mean, honestly, um, I, I carried a lot of shame with that just mm -hmm. because, you know, I grew up with my dad and then let's see, it was like the end of my ninth grade year when he went, mm -hmm. um, I carried a lot of shame. So I didn't talk about it a lot, but um, when it did come up, I mean, it wasn't surprising to a lot of people. It was just kind of mm -hmm. like, well, isn't that normal type of thing? Um, mm -hmm. Which for me, it really wasn't, it really right. took a toll on me. But, um, yeah, it, people didn't make a big deal about it, especially people that I was around. Like it wasn't mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, are you okay? It was just kind of like, mm -hmm these things happen type of thing um which is unfortunate because you I mean of course we know that single single families exist but I don't I think it's completely wrong to say that that's the majority and that's the norm because it yeah. really does affect people and a lot of people don't grow up that way so it was just interesting yeah. to kind of to kind of go through that and see that people didn't really you know make mm -hmm. a big deal out of it you know it was Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, that stigma still exists. Uh, not long ago, uh, a TCU professor uh, talked about being a single parent and, and several of her students, I don't know if you heard about it, but but uh, several of her students reacted and, and they were surprised saying, uh, oh, I'm surprised that you're, you're a single mom because you're not Black. So, so that that stigma is still very, very prevalent, and and the stereotypes yeah. still persist to this day. Um, mm -hmm. So, before we even get into uh, those trends at CCU, I'd like to know: whenever you were in high school, did you already have any idea um, that you would want to be part of any kind of social justice movement? Um, I didn't actually things changed for me when I went, I mean, okay, I did, but I didn't. So mm -hmm. um, being a part of cultural immigration club and BSU and things like that, you just kind of start to recognize, like that these things exist issues are, mm -hmm. you know, like issues with race are a thing. Um, I did, we what am I talking about? Yeah, we had a walkout um, in high school that I was a part of. Oh. Um, that I spoke at um, it, it didn't have to do with race. It really had to do with like the arts because I went to um, a school that had a music academy that I was a part of and they were trying to shut it down. So, you know, we walked out of school and all of that. So that was kind of my first, um, I guess, protest experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I realized then that, especially because I was learning more about my history um, and I realized that problems existed, I guess I did kind of think about social justice but I, mm -hmm. I didn't really know my role and I guess I was a little afraid because you know getting arrested is not like it's not it's not a small thing it's not it's not something that you should kind of mess around with right. unless you're ready for that right. especially when it comes to the movement um so I I think I I in my head I kind of knew that that was something that I wanted to do um especially because I thought I was going to go into law school and things like that and civil mm -hmm. rights attorney so it's always been something that's been on my mind but it wasn't until um I was actually going into TCU because I did transfer um from my old college Cal State University East Bay um I got an internship with a community organizing um nonprofit, and that's when things kind of changed for me um even though we didn't really focus what well, we did because i worked with the black jewish justice alliance um which kind of bridged the gap between rabbis and black clergy members um and it i mean it, it had ties from like the civil rights movement when mm -hmm. um you know rabbis would come out to assist you know dr king and Correct. be a part of the movements um so it was kind of like reinforcing that um and i worked with them and we did protests but a lot of it was for like wages like mm -hmm. um a lot of hispanic people in i mean around the nation but in los angeles are subject to um like working long hours not getting paid because you know they're afraid they're undocumented they're not sure what's going to happen they don't know their rights so that was what i spent my summer doing like fighting on their behalf 
um, making sure that the, the people that believe that they don't have voices have somebody to stand up for them. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of what put my foot in the door when it came to social justice and me kind of stepping out of my shell and realizing, okay, like I, I, I can do this. Um, and then I came into TCU, had an experience and said, okay, no, so we, we, we doing this again. So, yeah. So how did you end up at TCU? Um, okay, so when my brother actually went to Southern Methodist University, uh -huh. um, my big brother and my twin brother went there. Um, so it was a school, I had seen TCU when I was in high school and I was like, okay, I'm not a fan of SMU because I mean, at least at TCU, you walk around and you see people of color. Um, well, if you're here long enough, <laughs> you don't just see it off the back, but um, if you're there long enough, you'll see people of color. I asked you, I didn't see that. Um, I saw my brother, I saw a couple of his friends, um, but like his roommates, everything white. So um, I was like, yeah, this isn't the school for me because I need a little bit of diversity. And when I went to TCU, I saw that um, because I was here for a few hours and you know they that's what they show you they don't mm -hmm. they don't want you to think that it's just you know white um but you don't even realize that a lot of times the people that you see are athletes um just kind of in their element and you don't even see like the actual people who are here because they're busy honestly or you know they're working and things like that because that's what I did at TCU um but yeah I was transferring um, I got into a few schools. I got into NYU, schools like that. But TCU was the only school that offered me scholarship money. So I was mm -hmm. like, well, I guess I'll just go there. And I figured, you know, it, I'll be close to my brothers, which it's not that close um, because I didn't have a car. But um, yeah, that, that's when I just kind of made the decision to go to TCU. And what kind of scholarship did you get? Um, I got the transfer scholarship because mm -hmm. my GPA coming out of um, East Bay was really high. I okay. want to say like three, seven or something. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. So you got recruited for your academic talents, not necessarily for your athletic abilities. Let's say that for the record. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, what was, what did you know about TCU? So, you know, beside the fact that there was a bit of diversity, did you know about TCU's reputation? Did you know anything about TCU's history, especially its history in regards to race? Um, no idea. Um, I didn't actually start knowing about that until I was on campus and started to look and dig for information. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that I knew was that SMU and TCU were rivals and I would love to go to a school that was against my brother. Honestly, huh? like, and, and I figured that being in Texas, it probably did have a, a history, but I just was like, well, I mean, we'll, we'll just see how things go, figure out, you know, like what my fit is here and everything. And yeah, when I got to the campus, a lot just changed. Like I, I didn't have those same feelings when I got on campus. Yeah, reality set thing. Um, mm -hmm. What about your peers uh, at East Bay? How did they react when they found out you were transferring to TCU? Um, so I actually had a guy who um, basically he's grown up with my family. I, I had recently met him when I went to East Bay, but he mm -hmm. went there as well. Um, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I wasn't thinking about transferring until like the very last minute. I was just going to do um, a student exchange program and I oh. was going to go to an HBCU. But okay. I was like, nah, my, my political science, um, the, the head of the department had told me that if I wanted to go to law school and if I wanted to be taken seriously, I would need to go to a school with prestige, um, which now I, I realize that was horrible advice. And it just put me in a lot of debt, honestly. Um, but um, I, a, a lot of them were just kind of like, why are you leaving? Like, I don't understand, like, you're going to the South and the South is not like they, I, there was just a lot of questions, a lot of things floating around with people trying to figure out why. Um, and I really couldn't give them a definitive answer other than the fact that I was tired of East Bay and I, you know, my brothers were close by, but I mean, I, I never actually considered the why and, you know, like why should I pick a school like this or anything like that. So a lot of them asked those questions for me and I really didn't have a definitive answer. What about your mother? Um, 
did she encourage you to attend? Yeah, so my mom, really because my brothers went to SNU, um, mm -hmm. and they, they didn't really talk about their experience there and their experiences with race until later on. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, my mom was happy to, to know that we were all in Texas, and mm -hmm. she did like the school. So she was just like, yeah, go for it. Like, your brothers are there. You'll be good, all of that. And my brother, my twin brother ended up leaving. Um, when I came, he was already, he had decided he that that wasn't the school for him um so it didn't really matter but yeah she was happy that we were close so mm -hmm. are your parents educated <coughs> excuse me yes, sir. um thank you um both of them some college college mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they they have experienced the college life to some degree yes. and mm -hmm. okay all right um so what did you decide to major in? Like, was your major decided when you were at East Bay or did you change afterwards? Uh, how did you even decide what you wanted to major in? Yeah, so um, growing up, I always, the, the first time I said I wanted to be a lawyer, um, it was like Halloween. And I was, you know, we didn't really celebrate Halloween like that growing up. So I think I had dressed up in like a suit and people were like, what are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm a lawyer. And um, we had a, like an Easter play at church and I was like a prosecutor. And I was like, oh yeah, like this is what I wanna do. This is what I wanna be. Um, but when I first went into school, my major was communications. And I think I had chosen that just because it seemed like I, I actually didn't know what I wanted to major in. Um, and I just felt like communications, I could figure it out with that. Um, but I literally changed my major after like a couple of weeks to political science mm -hmm. um, because I, I realized that I was really into politics. I wanted to know more about it. And I was contemplating law school. So I was like, yeah, I feel like that's probably the best thing for me. Um, so a couple of weeks after I just decided on political science because it wasn't too direct with anything. And I didn't think I wanted to be in the criminal justice system. So I was just like, yeah, political science um, and we'll figure it out from there. Okay, so um, tell us about the year 2016. Yeah. What um, happened? Yeah, so um, I got to TCU um, that year. Honestly, the beginning of the year, I don't even remember. I just remember working on applications to transfer. And then the summer, I did community organizing and I was fired up <laughs> when I came to campus. Um, my first experience on campus because you move in before school starts um was looking i remember my roommate she was like yeah i think i'm going to join a sorority because you know i want to have friends um because there's a big sorority and fraternity i guess presence on campus not um in phc which is the predominantly black um fraternities and sororities it was panhellenic which is the predominantly white ones. Um, so my first experience, I'm in my in my room and they were like talking about something's happening in the commons um, and my room overlooked the commons. So I'm just kind of watching it, um, watching everything unfold. And there's just like, it's called bid day, which in my opinion has racial undertones um, be because basically it's just like, these people have decided to pick you and you're like running to meet them and there's like a sense of excitement. But in my opinion, it just, it, it was chaotic and it looked crazy to me. Um, but that was my first experience on campus. Um, just seeing all these white kids just, oh my gosh, yes. All these friends I get to have because I'm in a sorority now, um, running through the commons and hugging each other and it, it was it was honestly very odd to me um, but that was my first 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 experience on campus and I was like hmm if that's the culture here I don't know how I'm gonna fit but figure it out um so that was my first experience seeing bid day um and then the first day of school came around and I was I, I had went to my classes and I was right off campus on university and Barry, I believe, um, about to go somewhere and get food. And I was standing there waiting for the light. I think I was on the phone with my dad or something telling him about my first day. And there was a car 
like a pickup truck. It was like a, maybe like a Ford F-150 and it was full of like white guys um, with fraternity stuff on ironically. So of course they went to school at TCU and I was on the phone waiting for the light and I hear, yo, yo. And I'm like not paying any attention because I mean, growing up in California, especially in LA, you get hit on all the time when you're walking down the street. So when people are yelling at me from a car, I, I'd never pay attention to it because even if it's a family member, you can call me by my name and I'm not yo. So don't, mm -hmm. if, if you're, if you're referring to me as that, you don't know me. So mm -hmm. um, they're calling, they're trying to get my attention. I hear, all right, black bitch, um, black nigger bitch. And they just like pull off. And I was just like, hmm, okay. So that's how we're doing things around here. Um, and literally that, that's, that's literally how I reacted. Like, okay, that, that's how things are. Okay. Um, and it was crazy. That was my first day of school. And I was thinking like, okay, there's a little bit of diversity coming into the school. That's what I thought. But when I got here, I didn't see that. So I was like, okay, so I, I don't know if I made the right decision because this is what's happening to me. My first day of school, um, I saw a bid day with all these white kids running through the commons being happy. And oh my gosh, I have friends now because I paid all this money for a sorority. Um, and it, it was, there was just a lot of things that were happening that I was just kind of like, hmm, I don't know if I picked the right school. Um, but hearing that, I was just kind of like, well, seeing that this is this has happened to me my first day of school, I'm just going to kind of watch and observe and see how things are on campus and figure out if there is something to be done. And if there is something to be done, I want to see how I can change it. Um, so, yeah, that was my first first day. Um, and then I just kind of went through the semester, the first semester, and I joined what, Equality. What classes did you take? What classes yeah. did you take when you first first attended? Um, Do you remember? First semester. I don't remember what I took my first semester. I mean, I'm sure it was like some political science classes, mm -hmm. um, things like that. Not nothing, nothing that was too like important. Mm -hmm. in terms of like what I wanted to do at TCU that didn't happen until my second semester when I oh, took okay. this over but so yeah, about that. yeah um so my second semester I took the civil rights bus tour class mm -hmm. um and the reason why I took it was because I I had joined equality and I had joined I forget there was another org I had joined um and they were kind of discussing it um but I I had only joined orgs where I felt like I could meet people of color um, and equality is when I met um, a few people who had started telling me about the course and I was like okay yeah I definitely want to take that class mm -hmm. um, so I took that I the first day of class um, Dr. Krofman and Dr. Ferris are like you know introduce yourself your name um, like what you hope to accomplish and your you know major things like that you know the the normal stuff mm -hmm. and I remember I stood up in class and I was like hi my name's Chanel I'm a junior I forget what I said um and you know I want to get arrested and the reason why I had said that was because coming out of organizing um and because I worked directly with the director of the community organizing um nonprofit that I worked for um the the director was a rabbi and he had gotten arrested several times um but a lot of people in the black jewish justice alliance had gotten arrested and they didn't let interns get arrested because they don't want you to jeopardize anything and you know if you have pending things against you and you're in school they don't want that to affect you so we weren't allowed to um but i had seen a lot of people get arrested and i had seen the reasons why and i knew that if you're fighting for change and you really want to make a difference sometimes that big step is that so because I had been on campus and because I had seen things that I didn't like, I was like, hmm, I want to shake things up. And if it comes down to it, I would get arrested like for the cause for change on campus. So that's why I had stood up and said that. And I went through the class and I was just like, I want to soak up everything that I can about the civil rights movement. Because I mean, I had done my own research and I had done, a, I, had, I had known a lot but there were still things that I didn't know. Um, and I did learn a lot from that class. I did learn a lot from going to Mississippi and Arkansas and all of those places and speaking to other students and things like that. I did learn a lot more about organizing. And that's when me, Emily and Deanna, who were all in that class decided mm -hmm. we, 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 need to, we need to change some things on campus. 
Um, so all taking that class led to us deciding mm -hmm. we're going to do something. And we literally did something. We started our process that summer um, mm -hmm. because I was going to be on campus. Deanna was local and Emily, um, she wasn't, she wasn't around, um, but FaceTime, thank God for FaceTime. Um, that's when we were literally meeting a few times a week and just, we want, we, we see things that are wrong. We see things that need to be changed. Let's write a list of demands. And at the time, a lot of college campuses were doing that. Um, and a lot of like Ole Miss, for example, is kind of mm -hmm. where we got the idea to um, do something is because we were talking to the black students of the NAACP at Ole Miss and they were able to get the state flag taken down, which has the Confederate flag in it because, you know, it's just a lot of traumatic histories for people of color with associated with the Confederate flag. So they mm -hmm. were able to get that removed and seeing that they could do that in a state like Mississippi, we were like, I mean, Texas, like if they could do that in Mississippi, which is like light years behind Texas, we, we can do that here. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what sparked it in us. And that's what, that's why we started and, and what we did and what we worked towards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, just for the record, what was the name of that class that you were enrolled in? Um, I believe it was the Civil Rights Bus Tour. Um, and it was yeah. taught by? Um, Dr. Max Krokma and Dr. Emily Ferris. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so summer of 2016, you get together on FaceTime with Emily and Deanna, mm -hmm. and y'all just start a list? Just like that? Yeah, so... So, okay, so actually, um, so at the end of the class, at the end of the semester, we had a project um, mm -hmm. where we had to, I forget exactly what the project was about, but I remember I was working with Deanna and um, this this other girl, I don't remember her name, um, but we were, I was working with Deanna and we got to do, I, I want to say it was like doing some sort of research on something, something, I, I don't remember, but I remember that the research kind of sparked us wanting to do something. Mm -hmm. And because I mean, I, I didn't know Deanna before that class and I didn't know Emily before that class. Mm -hmm. And um, as we were working on things, it's when we started to get together and just kind of talk about like our experiences on campus. Well, me and Deanna more so than Emily because Emily had a different experience as she's white. Mm -hmm. um, but we were talking about our experiences on campus we are talking about how we could change and we were like super moved by the the students at Ole Miss and we were like we can do something let's do something um and I, I I don't I don't remember what our project was but I think some of it had to do with like us thinking about demands um I I just remember like that project kind of sparked us making change and um I was working on campus that summer um, so we were like, yeah, we want to do this next year. Like, this is what we want to do. We're going to do this next year. Um, so we literally spent the whole summer researching um, demands.org, which had like a bunch of other colleges and their demands. Mm -hmm. um, we, we went through a lot of other schools' demands. Um, we kind of shared experiences, talked to people, um, kind of understood that we weren't the only ones that were feeling this way about TC mm -hmm. um, and that we had kind of negative feelings because of the racist students, racist mm -hmm. things that were going on on campus, um, that that we weren't the only ones. So that's kind of what made us decide, let's write a list of demands, let's talk to um, staff and the chancellor is really who we really wanted to speak to mm -hmm. um, because it's almost like people were just kind of sweeping things under the rug, like something would happen and it would just be like, okay, well, it's not happening right now, so whatever. Or it's not a big, big thing, or people aren't talking about microaggressions, so whatever, it, it, it doesn't happen. But honestly, when, when I started looking at deeper things and I saw like the Harry Vincent incident um, and how he apparently almost got kicked out, but didn't, um, I, I just saw a lot of problems and I was just like, yeah, no, this is not, this is not okay. Um, a lot of things need to change. And that's when we started to draft the list of demands. I don't remember exactly when we finished, but I know it wasn't right when school started. Um, it was like 
few weeks after is when we started having meetings and mm-hmm. um, forming organizations and things like that. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about your methodology because some of the criticism that your demands have received is that they were baseless accusations. Um, right. And, you know, I, I read terms like uh, the demands were absurd and, and things mm-hmm. like that. It was just, uh, I remember seeing that meme say, uh, uh, give us free stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> so mm-hmm. what was your research strategy for you to come up with those demands? How did you investigate and how did you document that those microaggressions were taking place and that there was um, injustice going on? How did you come up with uh, the 100 million funds? That How did you come up with that number? How did you, um, what, what was your base, your basis for writing those demands in terms of data? Yes, yeah, so one thing that we did do was talk to other students um, just to compare experiences and things like that. And what we gathered from a lot of students is that sometimes it's not openly racist, right? So a lot of people didn't have the experience that I had getting called the N-word. A mm-hmm. lot of people didn't have that experience, but mm-hmm. they have those, those experiences in classes where they're the only Black person. Or um, if the civil rights movement or slavery or something having to do with um, Black history comes up, people look to them in the class, like, share your thoughts on this, which are microaggressions. These are things that you know, are, they they offend people, but people don't even know how offensive these things can be. Um, and you know, people assuming that they're athletes, or you know, people you 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 have stu- student tours on campus all the time, and people are looking at, at people of color like like they're for show. Like, oh my god, right. wow! Like because you're that one in a thousand people that they saw that day. Like you're the only person they saw, and they're just like, wow. Oh, wow, this person's wow, wow. Yeah. Just like, so you're the you're the yeah. expert on all things black. Exactly, exactly. Right. So and, and this is a lot of people's experiences or people right. assuming that the only reason that you're on campus is because you're either a community scholar or you're an athlete. Those are the right. only two reasons that you could possibly be at TCU, right? right? Um, so these were a lot of people's experiences. A lot of people shared the same thing over and over and over and over and over, and over again that they had to be the spokesperson for their race. Um, they were assumed to be athletes. They were assumed to be community scholars. And P- there was a stigma with community scholars as well that people thought that they didn't get here on merit. Like it was just kind of like a like a affirmative action type of thing mm-hmm. that they that they they weren't tops of their class in high school and they didn't make it to DC because they were actually smart. That like it, it was just the, the wildest things that were happening. So a, a lot of our data came from that, just like talking to people, documenting stuff, meeting with people and getting experiences. Um, you have a, the an approximate of, number of, the, of, of the, the students that you interviewed or that you talked to? Um, don't have a number. But if, if I'm thinking about the amount of students of color on campus that I knew and that Deanna knew, at least 80 to 100 people mm-hmm. that we spoke to had those experiences. Um, okay. Honestly, it could have been more, but just because I don't exactly know, I'll, I'll kind of stick with that number. Um, but yeah, a lot of our data came from that. And then we started meeting with faculty members. So like Dr. Max Crockmaw, mm-hmm. um, Dr. Lynn Hampton, um, um, faculty who kind of knew what was going on and could kind of help us formulate these demands. Um, and also with demands, um, you you kind of want to start big. Like you don't mm-hmm. want to just say, I demand change right. or right. I demand that you give us pencils. Um, like say, say some kindergartners are making demands for their teachers yeah. and they're just like, I demand pencils. Like you, you don't want to, you don't want to have like kind of demands that aren't going to get you anything. So you really want to be thoughtful in how you demand things and you want to shoot high. So if the reason why like the $100 million endowment thing, so we didn't want to say, give us a million dollars because 
we knew that TCU could probably give us a million dollars because as much money that's pumping through alumni and football games and things like that, mm-hmm. um, that, that we don't see to, you know, students of color, we don't see in programs, things like that. Um, we, we know that a million dollars is easy. So if we ask for a hundred million dollars, maybe they'll give us five. Right. So that, that, that was the logic behind like that demand and the, the logic behind, you know, asking the flag at half mast um, when black people are killed around the nation is, mm-hmm. you know, we don't know these faculty members that are dying. Like as, as harsh as that sounds, we don't know these people. We have no idea who these people are. These people have been retired for years. We, we don't know what they taught. We don't know anything, but we get an email about it every single time a fa- an old faculty member dies we get an email, the flag is half mass, and we're, we don't know who these people are. So we're walking by this flag at half mass. Meanwhile, we're hurting because Trayvon Martin or Philando Castile or Alton Sterling and people, people that we're hearing about are getting mm-hmm. killed and mm-hmm. we're becoming desensitized even though this is upsetting to us. Like, I can't tell you how many classes I missed because I was mourning the loss of a black person around this nation because I mean, you think it hardens you, but it, it really, it affects you every time. So, and th- these are things that are happening and these are things that are affecting students. And you can't just keep telling us to go see the, go to the mental health or go to the health center and talk to someone. Like, mm. it, it, that's not, that's not the end all be all. Like, if we feel actual support from our school, then, you know, like, then things could be a little bit better. So that's pretty much what we are asking for, like, support. Like, mm-hmm. we want to know that we are supported. Mm-hmm. We want to know that that if something happens, we can actually seek out people who care and not just, oh, go to the health center. Oh, you're feeling bad. I'm sorry. And then that's just kind of what it is. Or, you know, like we, we just want to know and feel that support that isn't just focused on sports and things that don't really matter, like superficial things that don't matter. Like, for example, when we did our first protest at the football game, I believe it was homecoming, and we sat down for the national anthem, we got, well, we were told that if we did that, alumni would be so upset. And, you know, that that would affect funding and things like that, which is why we were like, let's do it. Like, who cares? Like, who cares about their money when it's not going to us? So it doesn't matter. Like you guys are giving the money and you guys are doing other things with it that are irrelevant. Um, and meanwhile, we're not supported. So we are like, cool, let's do it. But we got a lot of flat for it because of that. And I think that's what kind of brought the attention to what was happening and what we were doing and why we actually got meetings and were able to sit down with people because they realized that it wasn't a joke and publicity especially for a school like TCU is really important. So if if the news is reporting, oh, not TCU had a great game, but there there were students that protested at this game, that it was bad publicity. So let's talk to them. Um, but yeah, I don't even know where I was going with that. But yeah. Um, so yeah, um, that, that, was, that was the methodology behind it. Um, well, speaking of that methodology, did you interview or poll any uh, white students or any brown students? Um, we did. We did talk to um, brown students, absolutely, mm-hmm. because we did kind of want to get their experience, even though we did kind of want to make it exclusive to, because I, I feel like students of color are so broad and colored, not colored students, um, but yeah, students of color, it's just a very broad term, right? And I feel like if you're not focused on a specific group, then groups get lost in the sauce. For example, now, um, like Asian Americans are getting a lot of hate, right? And laws are being passed and things like that for their safety and for the wellness of them. But then we forget about Black people and we forget about Hispanic people and what they're going through and and all of that. So if, if you're not focused on one particular group, then it's just so easy for things to just kind of like, okay, students of color, students of color, students of color, and not black students and not Hispanic right. students and right. all of that. So I think right. we really wanted to focus on black students. Um, mm-hmm. But we did, we did speak to brown students as well to get their experience. And we did have brown students that were like, yo, what about us? 
mm -hmm. you're like, don't worry. We're, it, it, listen, it'll, it'll benefit everyone in the long run, which is why mm -hmm. some of the de demands we did say students of color, because that was important as well. Um, but, but yeah, we, we did talk to white students, uh, not a lot. Um, mm -hmm. We had white students reaching out to us, like mm -hmm. allied people who were just kind of like, we're here for you, we support you. If you need anything, let us know. Um, because we knew that we were gonna get a lot of flack from people who didn't have the same views as us. Um, mm -hmm. Like when, when the demands got closer to being put out because the chancellor was getting phone calls from students, white like white students who didn't agree with us. Um, they, they were like trying to get information and things like that. Um, but in terms of talking to them beforehand, we, we knew what their experience was. So we felt it wasn't really necessary to, to yeah. speak to them. Honestly. Okay. Um, when you're talking about lowering the flags, and we will talk about each demand later on, but um, mm -hmm. a demand like lowering the flag when um, a young black person is killed by by white police, mm -hmm. um, how would you know that? this incident is uh, an injustice. How can you know that it's a black person um, that is killed outside of the, the police officer's duty? Um, because until there's an investigation, can we really say that that person is a victim of police violence? Yeah, so that, that's 100% right. Um, of course, you, you don't want to go into a situation and assume that there's just racism behind it, right? Mm -hmm. But usually when, when when these videos come out or when you hear about it or, or you see the video, because a lot of times there's videos attached to them mm -hmm. and you hear what's going on in the video. And I mean, even if, I mean, it's not directly pointed to race, we know that some sort of injustice was done. And because well, this person is- Numbers don't lie. I mean, you know, if, if exactly. statistically there's such a discrepancy, we know yeah. that, you know, it is it is definitely a, a factor. Race has to be a factor. Yeah. So I mean, like, yeah. So for example, if in the video they're like, or at like things come out and they're like, oh, I thought he was reaching for a gun, but you see his hands on the steering wheel, mm -hmm. and you know that it was done at the hands of a white person police specifically who you know like honestly as, as much as I try to preach like we don't hate people and things like that I mean the, the a lot of people of color are afraid of the police mm -hmm. so if you see that this thing is being done at the hands of a police officer who's also white mm -hmm. it, it just kind of it sparks something in you it fear anger it it just it arouses a lot of emotion mm -hmm. um so because it does that and because it, it was done at the hands of a white person it just to, to me i'm not going to speak for everyone because uh, i wasn't going to say to us but to me it it it's an injustice period mm -hmm. so if 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 it affects me the way it does or or even even seeing the video on facebook and seeing the comments and what people have to say and comments are racist and things like that, you know that there's racial undertones behind it. Um, so it it just it, it to feel that support from school, mm -hmm. you like you that that's just kind of something that you want because it, to me it's a lynching. Mm -hmm. it, it, there there's no other way around it. That that's my opinion. Modern day lynching. Okay. Yeah. Um. Can you tell us a little bit about the faculty that helped you or that supported you with those demands? I know you mentioned Max Krocknell. Uh, what was the role of uh, Dr. Lane Hanted, for example? Um, yeah, so we met with her several times, mm -hmm. um, a little bit to get her experience on campus and what is kind her of. Experience? Um, well, she, she is a black woman on campus. Mm -hmm. So sometimes she felt as if she was being discriminated against by other faculty and, you know, by the powers that be. 
Um, and we, we also kind of wanted to pick her brain and kind of see if she felt that we were valid in what we were doing uh-huh. and in how we were feeling because she went to a PWI and she had those experiences as well. So she knew that it wasn't just a fluke and she knew that it was very much possible that we were experiencing these things because uh-huh. her she had an experience as a faculty member and she knew that, of course, we were going to have those same experiences as students because she knew who she had in her classroom sometimes. Mm-hmm. And she knew like the, the questions that she would get from students and people, you know, looking at her and thinking that she doesn't have certain merit because she is a Black woman. Mm-hmm. Um, so she had those experiences and she knew that we, we were experiencing that as well. So mm-hmm. it was more for that support that we were meeting with her. Um, because she looked like us and she was one of the few people that looked like us and could understand what we were going through. Anyone else? Uh, I mean, Dr. Crockmaw, because he was so, I mean, I believe he's in the history department, but because that's his thing, like he's big on social justice, we knew that he was a good person to talk to. Mm-hmm. Um, we we had formed an organization, Students of Color, 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 Color Coalition and Dr. Brad Lucas was one of our advisors as well. Um, And he was just like a good person to speak to that didn't carry a lot of bias and could really tell us what it is and like get our words together and things Mm -hmm. like that because he was in the English department. So um, we we really were just like super well-rounded in who we spoke to. And we also, um, Daryl Wyrick who worked um, in, what did he, what was, department I forget it was in the blue but I don't I don't remember exactly the department that he was in it was like on the second floor over there on the left hand side I forget, I forget what it was like included I I forget what 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 he worked for but he was one of our advisors as well um and he was another just support system like our reasoning for re- reaching out to faculty was of course to pick their brain but also just have that support of mm-hmm. someone on on a level that was like, you know, faculty is important. And then of course staff members, but we, we just needed that support from someone who wasn't a student. Um, mm-hmm. Cause we knew that we, we would have someone to back us up on that level. Uh, can you tell us about, I think it's uh, Kathy Kevin's um, toll. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. We we met with her um, mm-hmm. when we we first met with her with the chancellor. No, we met the chancellor by we okay. So we first met with the chancellor, which is me, Emily, and Diana, mm-hmm. and we had a one on one with him, and we we didn't come out of it too happy because we felt like there was kind of a lot going on there that was done because we were coming like there was an essence magazine on Mm -hmm. the table with barack obama and his wife and their family which we thought was kind of odd because we we've never heard the chancellor mention anything about that so we we thought it was kind of placed there strategically um so we we talked to him first about the demands and then he was like let's have a meeting with all these other people like these cat the kathy cadence toll and the Mm -hmm. um the head of the athletics department and and all these heads of stuff and just I, I think it was kind of like an intimidation tactic but didn't really get to us uh-huh. um but then after we had that meeting with all of those people we met with Kathy Cavins told separately and uh-huh. she was basically saying we can't do this demand we're not going to do this we can't uh-huh. do this we're not going to do this so Whereas we thought that she would be like open to things based on how things went in the second meeting, like, oh, we support you, we're here for you. When we met with her separately, it was a lot more of psych. Uh, We can't do that. We're not going to do that. Maybe if you change this up, we could think about this. But we basically felt like we had to do something else in order to feel heard because the meetings didn't go anywhere. Like, we were just kind of like, well, we thought you were on our side, but now it's questionable. Um, So, yeah, that that was our experience, or my experience, rather, with Kathy, uh, Dr. Kathy Cadence-Toll. 
which I mean, I, 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 she was she was a very nice person, very nice lady. When every time I would see her, and she'd always, "How are you?" and "Hope you're doing well," and things like that. Which you know, that support is nice. But when it <laughs> came to the demands, I felt like we weren't being heard. I see. Yeah. Oh, what about the meeting with the chancellor? How did that go? Um, the initial meeting, I felt he was just trying to kind of understand where we we're coming from. Um, and this was before we went public with the demands. We had sent him an email and we were letting him know like these demands exist. If we don't hear from you, it will become a public thing. We will make sure that everyone knows about it, uh -huh. um, which is kind of the tactic that a lot of people use when it comes to demands. Um, but our first meeting with him, I felt was just kind of him going like, oh, we hear you, let's meet with these other people. We hear you, let's meet with these other people. Um, these other people should know about this. Uh -huh. We hear you, whatever. Um, and then I remember getting a call just before it was released to the public via TCU 360. Uh -huh. um, he called me, the chancellor called me on my cell phone. Um, and he was like, I have a student who wants these demands and wants to talk to you. And um, she was, her Her name was Annabelle. She was um, with a conservative like newspaper who couldn't wait to speak negatively about it because that's what she ended up publishing. Um, uh -huh. But she really wanted these demands and her angle was, oh, like, oh, I, I really want to talk to you and everything, but it ended up backfiring and it was very negative, but uh -huh. um, I, I just felt like the, the chancellor also wasn't supporting us, and the reason why he wanted to have this meeting is in my opinion, I felt like it was for intimidation, because you know, if, if you're meeting with all of these, um, Dr. Darren Turner, Dr. Mm -hmm. K Kathy Kamen Toll, Provost Donovan, um, the head of the athletics department and all, all these different people who have such high rankings at TCU that somehow, and especially if they don't agree because a lot of them didn't, they're just kind of like microaggression. Like, what are you talking about? Like things, you know, like I, I just felt like it, there was no support and then we didn't hear from him and it was just straight to Kathy Cabin's toll. So it was just like, um, I, I, I wasn't happy with the meetings that we had with him at all. I just, I, I didn't feel, feel like it went anywhere. And I just felt like he passed us off to someone else. Like I get it, you're busy, but th this is your school and this is happening and this is your job to deal with it. But I guess that wasn't the case. What about um, Dr. Darren Turner? Um, Was he supportive as a black man maybe? He or was supportive. Yeah, he, he was supportive. Um, he didn't say I, the I, whole administration, um, you know, pass it on to someone else or? Yeah, well, they, they did that with him as well. Um, we had asked for there to be a, I, I forget what we called it. I think chief diversity officer, officer or inclusion, something like that. Yeah, officer. And we wanted, ideally, we wanted someone who was not on campus. Because Dr. Turner had his, he had his role on campus. Mm -hmm. He was what the Title IX guy and that, that's what he worked on and mm -hmm. community scholars, he supported them a lot of the time. And mm -hmm. ideally when you ask for something, you want it to be, you really, like you want it to be implemented the way that you want it to be implemented. And I felt like it was a cop out for them to ask him to take over that role because, you know, he had his own role that he was working on. And I felt like it would have been better for someone without TCU bias mm -hmm. to come in and effectively run that role. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt like they were they were also using him as a way to just kind of get us to be quiet, um, which I didn't appreciate. Um, when I found out that he was going to take over that role, it was like a bittersweet moment because it was like, well, they're taking it seriously and they're getting someone for that role. However, I, I didn't want it to be Dr. Turner. I didn't want it to be that easy. Like I didn't want it to be that simple. I wanted them to do the work, mm -hmm. like meet with people, interview people and find the right person for that for that role. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I would have wanted. So what did he do concretely? What specific step did he take? 
nothing that I can remember. I don't, I don't remember anything being done. I just remember him having that title and then that was it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I felt, I, I honestly felt with those demands that they did a, a lot to just kind of keep us quiet. Like they just didn't, they just didn't want us to continue to push the issue. So they mm-hmm. just kind of gave us a little bit and said, okay, we did something. Mm. That's how I felt. So how do you make of the, the statement that the chancellor issued afterwards? I mean, he, he did, you know, send a letter, although you had some uh, media that, that criticized the demands and called them absurd and ridiculous and outrageous. And, you know, these are the words that they actually used. Um, but then despite that criticism, Chancellor Boschini said, well, this is not that unreasonable. And, and he issued forth a letter. What do you make of that letter? um well since nothing came from it I I wasn't I wasn't particularly happy with it I felt like it was kind of a saving face thing and nothing nothing was done like I I literally felt that every everything that happened as a result of us having those meetings and TCU 360 getting their hands on the demand we, we gave it to them we said here here Tamara here take it um but the, I I felt like a lot of what they were doing was like purely political like they like you want to look like you're for your students because you don't want to seem as though you're not supporting your students because I think at the time um what school was it in Michigan I think the guy the chancellor or president had stepped down or whatever um I I don't remember exactly what school but that that it was like a lot of things were happening on college campuses Mm -hmm. and I feel like it was it was like what he was supposed to do was write that letter and send it out to the students. But I, I don't feel like there was anything behind it. I just felt like, mm. you know, it just kind of was that. Uh-huh. Yeah. So let's let's go through the demands. And uh, but but before before I we do that, what um like did you stick around when did you graduate when did you leave uh tcu and and i'm asking that because that will affect your perspective on what was done about the demands and uh how impactful those actions may or may not have been yeah so i graduated in 2018 Mm -hmm. so i we worked that whole year until Deanna and Emily graduated in 2017. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and honestly, when I went back into school the next, the following year, I was so burnt out and I was so tired. And I literally, racial battle fatigue is what I had because I was exhausted and I mm-hmm. I couldn't, I, I was just, it was a lot. It was a lot because I, I got a lot of hate and it was yeah. just a lot happening. So it, it, it was very, very difficult. Um, and I know people tried to help and, get things done that year and I, I was a little bit trying to help them but it was it was difficult but yeah I graduated 2018. Okay so so um first you wanted the code of conduct uh, to be revised yeah do you feel like this has been done have you had any interaction with the new code of conduct or the most recent code of conduct I haven't, I haven't looked at it, honestly. Uh-huh. Um, I, I mean, I, I, now, now that you mentioned it, I'm going to go look at it. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't I have no uh-huh. idea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, we do as, as a new faculty at TCU, I, I just want to tell you that I did have to complete training on, uh, you know, racial and, and, um, uh, minority sensitivity so we we do have to do this as faculty um yeah. we do have training on diversity and inclusion uh yeah. that being said you know it's it's a training i mean you, you watch the video you take a quiz and and that's the part of the training so it's it's like yeah. taking a course but it it's not necessarily um an assessment on how it's going to be applied but i just want to yeah. let you know that the training has been implemented and it is mandatory because I had to go through it. Um, You've asked for an increase in faculty of color. Have you seen Mm -hmm. any change in that in the year and a half that followed uh, the 2016 demands? Yes, so 
I remember I I, I want to say there there was a change in this and I do want to say that they did increase the the faculty of color I I know that that that, that did happen I don't mm-hmm. think it was exactly how we wanted it to be mm-hmm. but I know that there was an increase mm-hmm. yes I I know that 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 did happen and and I also know too that there were some faculty that left as well but I yeah, know so that it did address retention that was a problem yeah you know, mm-hmm. we we do have some faculty member who left TCU um and several of them um because of allegations of racism yes so retention has been a problem yes mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah um, but I, I know there has been a change mm-hmm. you also asked for um uh training against anti-semitic intolerance microaggressions um like i said you know this has been addressed at least to some extent um, but we did complete the training on microaggressions and, and ways to counter it, uh, ways to avoid it, and, um, you know, conflict um, de-escalation and, and, and all of that. Um, are you aware of any annual report that reflects TCU's progress when it comes to um, increasing diversity? Okay. No. Okay. Um, so, I will... Mm-hmm. I remember seeing something, but I I don't like. I remember thinking like this is inaccurate, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because, like because what see what data shows and what you see are two different things. Yes, like, yes, two two very very different things. Like mm-hmm. it could say yeah we have five percent now of students of color, but like it still feels like negative one percent like it still feels that way mm-hmm. um yeah i, I want to say i saw something like the report or something mm-hmm. i don't remember, I don't mm-hmm. remember. Yeah. yeah and and it would be interesting to kind of see um those report if you take out the athletic uh or the student athlete population and and take right. uh the same statistics in the non-athletic student population, I'm sure the numbers would uh, change drastically. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, okay, so you asking for the spark of meaningful dialogue, seeing an increase in cultural awareness. What have you seen in the year and a half that followed the demand in terms of cultural awareness programs? I mean, I honestly didn't see any change when I was on campus. Um, There were still like the, you know, the things that would happen regularly, like every year, I know that they, the um, like Native American students, Uh there's like an event for that. Uh Um, There's still like the the events that, you know, just kind of happen regularly, but I didn't see anything other than that. And I mean, I know they like to say like that, uh, the lead on stuff and I remember I did a video where I was like I am black or whatever and it was like supposed to be this big campaign but like I, it, it, to me it was just like the same thing and it, there was nothing that was like other than that video I felt like that that's all that's all that it was I, I didn't see any change when I was on campus in terms of that uh, what about the endowment for uh, scholarships? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't think uh, did. I I don't. I want to say that they were like increasing the numbers of community scholars or something uh-huh. like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but. I remember when we had that meeting, we had said like expand community scholars, like mm-hmm. don't just leave it for the area, like mm-hmm. expand, like maybe we do all of Texas and like do do it that way and increase spots and things like that. And I, I do want to say I, I think that that did happen. Well, not not like expanding community scholars, but I think there were like a few more spots or something like that. But there there still isn't like an actual scholarship that is like mm-hmm. for students of color, like there other than community scholars and things like that but yeah no not not while I was on campus were there any talk 
of a multicultural center um, when you were still there? Yeah. Um, so when we had the meeting with Kathy Cavins Toll, um, that that was like I feel like that was kind of what we talked about the most, like mm -hmm. because she had a plan, I guess, to in the blue to make like a multicultural center type of thing instead of it being the the office of inclusion where like the community scholar mm -hmm. hub is um like she wanted to put it in the blue and do like all this like big thing but i i honestly felt like she was pulling my leg i i didn't believe that that was going to happen i i had no faith in that and I don't think it's happened yet I don't think there's any as much construction that's been going on at TCU I haven't mm -hmm. seen any construction that is with that so I felt like she was pulling my leg I feel like she was just kind of saying yeah it's a plan but I mean well I wanted yeah. to let you know um yeah. it has been approved perfect yeah. I'm happy to hear that <laughs> Um, so I'm going down the demands and I'm seeing that uh, you were asking for uh, Department of Diverse Studies. Know that you have a lot to um, say about the creation of Chris, for example. Um, mm -hmm. Did that fulfill what you wanted to see done um, with that particular demand? Um, I believe we put that demand in specifically for Crest mm -hmm. because I believe at the time it was still like in the process mm -hmm. and we really wanted to push that forth. So yes, um, the only thing that I think we did kind of want to do too as well, because I mean, at Cal State East Bay, I was a, um, I had an African-American studies minor mm. and Press is ethnic studies, right? I think it's right. no, sorry, what am I saying? Cr critical race. Comparative yeah, race. Comparative yeah. race, I think. Comparative race, sorry. Mm -hmm. Comparative race and ethnic studies. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's that's great. And I remember I had sat in on the class and they were talking about like race, which is which is great. It, great, mm -hmm. and it's something to talk about. But I think we also wanted to do like um Native American minor, like something like that, like American Indian type mm -hmm. of deal like where you can actually focus on different different um, okay. races that, that exist within America mm -hmm. um, and have it be a minor because there's a lot there's a lot of information to know about um, different things and I think it's very possible. So I think we also wanted that as well. But Crest is a great start and Crest is making strides. So mm -hmm. yes, yeah. So you, you wanted Crest to be a department or just a unit? You wanted it to be a minor, a concentration? What status did you want Crest to have? Major. I wanted major. it to be a major. Yes, I wanted it to be a major. Um, and to for, for people to, and then I also, I don't know if it was in that demand, but also to have uh, something in the core that focused on ethnic studies as well. So that it was a required class or people who are coming in to have to take something regarding race or regarding ethnic studies. So wanted that in core, um, in, yeah, in the core curriculum as well. Was that implemented? Mm, no. And the justification was the cultural awareness um, pillar of core, because I that does exist, but it doesn't. You can there. There's like the the scope of classes that you can take within that are just so broad. And I don't think that it has anything to do with that, but that was the justification for that, I remember. I see. Um, so Crest is, is, is now more of a program yeah. than an actual department. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what happened with that? When did the status change and why did it change? I don't. I don't remember. I, rem I remember like seeing a bunch of stuff with it, but I don't, I don't remember, honestly. Brain That's all right. That is all right. <laughs> <laughs> it was a while ago. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm uh, looking at Greek life now. Cultural sensitivity training for Greek life. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, 
because of bid day and because um, I, I remember speaking with um, a student who was in Panhellenic. She was a black student. Um, she still is black, um, but she was a black student on campus. Um, but she was saying about how they have like a slave auction thing um, within one of the sororities. And I do. felt, and I don't know if they still do, but they did when she was, and that was her freshman year, she graduated in 2018. So it, it was probably, well, no, I think she transferred. So maybe like 2015, 2016 is when they were still doing it. I forget which which um, which sorority it was. Um, but yeah, would, I, would I felt like- share, Would you care to share her name? Tamara, I don't remember her last name. Her name's Tamara. I have her information. <laughs> so if you want to talk to her, I can give that Please. to you. Please, I need to interview that person, yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, she, I think she's in Fort Worth, so it's great. Um, but yeah, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> um, but yeah, she, she was telling me about that. She was telling me about her experience within um, Greek life, um, the Panhellenic Council. And honestly, I saw no black people when they were doing bid day. I saw none of that. I saw no, no, school of color I saw none of that um and I felt like that was a problem because a, a lot of what they do even when they have their parties and things like that like usually the only students of color that can go are athletes but like they will turn you away at the door they will literally say oh no you can't oh it's cool things like that so they they need it more than anyone because though th a lot of that that's like the culture on TCU are those sororities and fraternities. And if they don't care or if they don't have any, like if they're ignorant to people of color, then there's never gonna be a change in culture on campus. Like there's never gonna be that because they are the culture for the most part. They, they hold so much of the power on campus when it comes to students. So if they lack that, it's gonna be a fight for a long, long, long time. Um. You wanted the establishment of Asian American studies major, Native American studies major. Um, yes. Have you seen any progress made toward that? No, not at all. I mean, I, 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 feel, I feel like sometimes I feel like they, like it's so easy to use the justification of what well, we did correct or what well, well this. And I mean, I, I if something has changed, please let me know. But when I was on campus, I didn't see anything, so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, speaker series, university funded speaker series. Have you seen any um, any speaker in the conference, anything, any program? Not by the university. I know, I know Crest was doing speakers and things like that. I know, see, that's the thing. I feel like Crest, takes up a lot of it's and they pick up a lot of that yeah. yeah everything's crest or the office of inclusion like they do that but it's yeah. it's not like chancellor presents cornell west it's not like that it's mm -hmm. that's it's not that and that that's what we want that's yes. what we wanted but yeah it, it shouldn't just be on crest and it shouldn't just be on the office of inclusion it should it shouldn't mm -hmm. just be on them yeah, so so uh, with the Race and Reconciliation Initiative, uh, one of the programs that we have um, is the series of virtual town hall meetings. Uh, mm -hmm. We've had over 18 town hall meetings since the RRI began, which was, you know, pretty much in September, October. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we do address things like that. Um, we have talked about, for example, race neutral policies on campus or um, being black in the academia, uh, being uh, what it means to be a black graduate student, um, you know, higher ed and race. Uh, we even had conversation about the lynching of Fred Rouse, which is the last recorded lynching in the Fort Worth area in 1921. Um, mm -hmm. We go as far back as slavery day um, where we had a talk about um, the first recorded staff, black staff member for TCU um, back mm -hmm. in the 19th century. So do you think that that's somewhat satisfy that demand? I mean, it's great that it's happening. Mm -hmm. And I like that 
that this initiative is a thing. Is that what but, you had in mind? Is that the type of programs that you had in mind? I, I still would want it to be like Chancellor presents this. Like, mm -hmm. even though even though that seems to be like kind of like political again, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I just I just want it to come directly from the top and have their name attached to it and mm -hmm. have them be very much a part of it instead of it being like, okay, let's create this initiative and you do this, you know, like I don't know. So so what it, you're saying is uh, are you, are you saying you, you would like for the board of trustees and the chancellor to directly organize these things? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what we wanted. And and um, well, first of all, they're, they're very busy people, <laughs> which yeah. you probably imagine. Um, yeah. So the fact that, for example, the Race and Reconciliation Initiative is a task force directly appointed by the board of trustees and the chancellor, um, it's still not, to your interpretation, it's still not coming from the top. I mean, it's just, it is, but like, I, I want them to have more to say about it. Like, mm -hmm. I want them actively involved. The that, yeah, that, that's what I would have wanted, that act, that them active. So mm -hmm. it's like, you're appointing people, but you're also a part of it, type mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's ideal. But yeah. I mean, I understand people are busy. I get it, but you know, this is important. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for your honesty. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at you know, Chief Officer of Diversity and Inclusion, um, overseeing curriculum and projects. Mm -hmm. So I know that this was at least partially um, partially addressed. What do you think of what was done with the Chief Officer of Diversity and Inclusion? Are you satisfied? No, and the reason why is because mm -hmm. I feel like it was very limiting. Mm -hmm. So they put Dr. Turner in this role. Right. And I felt like initially they wanted like a lot of research to be done mm. which is fine but what we were asking for to oversee programs and things like that never actually happened because it was still the same people overseeing things and the same people mm -hmm. putting on events and things like that so I felt that's why I really feel like it was a cop-out for them to get Dr. Turner I mean listen they could have gotten anybody else on campus who, like who could devote all of their time to this or hire someone who could devote all of their time for this mm -hmm. and have an office and it grow from there because that's what should have happened it should have been like okay starts with this one person this person needs help okay this person needs help this person needs help and then it becomes like a whole working machine but that's not what happened um so I, I just felt like it was a cop out. I felt like it was just like, and and the way it was done, the way the announcement happened as well, it was just like, I remember seeing it and being like, so, <laughs> like I, I I like I was not happy about it. Like it was it just wasn't, it, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't working at all. Do you remember Emily and Diana's reactions? It was the same. Like I remember, I saw it, and we were like, we have a group message, and we were like, "Yo, what is this? Like, what? Like this? This is not what we were asking for. This is not what we were asking." I remember Deanna. I I want to say she was kind of upset as well. Like she was just like, "Nah, that that's not good." And then of course, other students of color were like, "Oh, did you see?" And we were just like, "Yeah," and this is not what we wanted, but. Yeah. I guess. And, and, and I feel like they were using that, like, oh, we got Dr. Turner in there and Dr. Turner and Dr. Turner. And they, they kept bringing it up and it was like, so what? Like, and then what happened? That, that's like, they just, yeah, it wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't ideal at all. It wasn't, it wasn't what we wanted. Are you aware of his recent retirement? Yeah. What do you make of it? I mean, I, I knew it was going to happen 
but now that he's gone, it's like who's going to step in and really, really get everything done? Who knows? Okay, when you say you knew this was going to happen, can you care to elaborate? Well, yeah, I mean, like Dr. Turner, he's not a young guy. So, I mean, eventually, you know, he was going to retire. And I know, I know that like he, you know, like sometimes you just get to that point where you're just like, eh, I'm over it type of thing. And I, I don't think he really got there, but I just felt like, you know, it was just time um, for him yeah. to retire. I, I, I honestly believe that he was, I thought he was going to retire like 2018, but. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. so you you do not see any issue with the timing of his retirement. You think it was just the logical chronology of things? Yeah, I, I see that look. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I feel, I feel I like make you so comfortable. I did tell you I was gonna make you comfortable with it. <laughs> I feel, I feel like there's so many, honestly, I feel like there's so many things at TCU that are calculated. Uh-huh. So <laughs> I feel like it was calculated, but I also knew he would eventually retire. Okay. But I, I feel like a lot of things are calculated. Once we I, all. Once we all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Very good. So we addressed demand number 13 already, which was, you know, uh, the flag to be lower um, when, yeah. when, people of color are murdered. Um, and, mm-hmm. and you did carefully use the term murder, not just killed, but murdered. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason why I ask you about this is because whenever you're using the term murder, that means that it has to have been established following an investigation we determining mm-hmm. this was murder. Um, yeah. So, so uh, but, but, but thank you for um, addressing that. And then um, of course, eventually you are asking that no negative repercussion may be suffered by the people who created or implemented those demands. Have you suffered any retaliation of any kind? Um, not at the hands of faculty or staff administration, anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, students and people on the outside, I, I got a lot of hate. I got a lot of negative comments. I got a lot of, I got some emails that were negative. I got a lot of things that were not like less than ideal. But luckily, a lot of people didn't know who exactly I was. Cause I remember when the demands came out, Mm -hmm. I was in um, urban politics with Dr. Ferris or or urban policy, whichever it was called. Um, And she discussed it and nobody knew that I was one of the people who had wrote. So I was just like kind of listening to everyone. And then eventually I was like, listen, I wrote this because X, Y, and Z. And I was very emotional because uh, people were saying very upsetting things and it it was just a lot going on. But um, yeah, I I got a lot, I got a lot of backlash personally. I got a lot of backlash. Can Um, you get more specific or give examples as to what kind of backlash you got? I mean, I know you mentioned emails, but what was the content of those emails, for example? Um, like you don't know what you're talking about, and um, oh, just wait, just wait and see what happens to you, and and like kind of threatening things in a way. Um, comments on Facebook, like when TCU 360 posted things, um, people were messaging me directly on Facebook, saying very hurtful and hateful things, like why don't you just go pick another school, or you don't belong there, and things like that, which basically are the exact reasons why we wrote these demands because obviously if if people have the gall to say things like that and they're associated with TCU Mm -hmm. you're a part of the problem um so that's kind of how I started to look at things like you're a part of the problem and you're the reason why we're doing this so Mm -hmm. keep keep writing me um and then you know the people off that probably have no association with TCU who were like that meme that said, oh, we want free money and things like that. That was like a whole negative article. Like there were, there were several of those. Um, But yeah, a a, a lot of things came on Facebook a lot. I got a lot of Facebook messages, especially after that, um, after the, I I had spoken on the news, I got a lot more of that. Um, Some, some people were very nice. A lot of people were trying to meet with me. Like I had a lot of free lunches which was nice. Um, well, you did I have a lot of, stuff, didn't you? <laughs> right. 
a lot of people wanted to meet for lunch and just kind of pick my brain and talk to me. So that was cool um, to just have dialogue with students who mm-hmm. maybe didn't really know what was going on, like thought they knew what was going on, maybe disagree, things like that. Um, it, it, it was just, I mean, I got a lot on both sides, but mm-hmm. I did get a lot of negative messages as well. Would people, like, um, would people hide behind some kind of username or do you, like, did anybody address you with those, um, those threats with their name? Because you say that it's, it's people, but you have actual names of people. Not that I'm asking yeah, you to share actually, them, but, but would people actually, you know, let, let you know who they were? Yeah. On Facebook, um, pe- like literally alumni, um, okay. people with, people with kids on campus like and would literally say I have a I have a freshman or I have a sophomore on campus and I don't appreciate blah 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 Mm -hmm. or um I went to this school in this year and you don't have to go here you don't need to associate yourself with this Mm -hmm. um you're wrong like all of that stuff but a lot of people were just telling me to pick another school and if you're not happy here go somewhere else and things like that which okay Hmm. so so you, again, the covering up of things that are happening because you're pretending it doesn't exist, but an experience that someone has is an experience nonetheless. So you can't say, oh no, that didn't happen when it happened. So, wow. yeah. Okay, uh, so we're we're reaching the end of this interview here, but, but I do have a couple more questions. Uh, mm-hmm. One of them, you might be aware of this, um, we extended the invitation for the interview um, to the three of you. Mm -hmm. Emily accepted, you accepted, Deanna did not. Mm -hmm. Um, Were you aware that she she refused to participate in the oral history? No, but I mean, I can can definitely understand why. So so she she, um, explained that you know, there there were some risks associated with participating in in what we're doing right now. Yeah. What is your perspective on the risk that you're taking? And since you have accepted to participate in that um, in that oral history project, what are you expected to face following today's interview? I mean. If if people see this, I'm sure they won't be completely happy, which is fine. But I've I've gotten to a point in my life where I don't really care who I upset because if it's my truth, it's my truth. So I don't really care. Um, you can be upset, and you can be upset over there, and you can tell me you're upset, but it it's not gonna re- it's not really gonna affect me. Um, and I mean, I got my degree, so what are you gonna do? Take it away? Um, like I I don't I don't believe that there's really any risk to me because. Number one, I'm not in the area. Number two, I am not really, I mean, other than the fact that I graduated from TCU, I'm not, there, like there really isn't anything that's, that can actually affect me at this point. It's not gonna affect my work. It's not gonna affect anything like that. So other than that, if people see it and they're upset, be upset. But I, I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter. It's fine. Like I, yeah, it doesn't matter <laughs> to me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one thing that we haven't really addressed that much is uh, once you graduated in, in 2018, what have you done since then? Yeah, um, so I have so you, been... You have, a, you have a, a, a growing family, you know that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just had a baby, got a newborn. He's what, he'll be two months in a few days. But yeah, um, I mean, other than working and just like, honestly, just trying to make sure that I'm still feeding my brain and doing a lot of research and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I I did think about going into organizing, um, but I live in LA and it is very difficult to survive um, when when you're not making that much money. So I've been really focusing on just like trying to make a better future for me and my children and Mm -hmm. my child, children, not yet at least, Um, but my child and then um definitely want to get back into organizing and definitely want to get back into a place where I'm making real change Mm -hmm. um I did go to school to get my paralegal certificate but then I started looking at things like you know what I'm not about to do no disrespect to anyone in that field but (laughs) they do a lot of the work and don't get the 
the pay for it. And I'd rather mm -hmm. be an attorney if I'm just going to do that. But, you know, I'm in a lot of debt from school, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> so um, what do you but, do? Are you working? What do you do? Yeah, so I'm actually, I work for a tech company um, and I am in customer support, mm -hmm. which honestly that is a way to make change. So, yeah. and that's how I look at it. Um, I did do retail for a while, but I honestly think I found my niche in customer support and working mm -hmm. directly with people because the day-to-day -day interaction that you have with people can, you know, it can make or break someone's day. So that's how I look at it. And even though I'm not doing organizing and I'm not like in that type of change, I'm still in a changing type of environment where I get to impact people. So, and that's really what I'm passionate about. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm doing right now for the time being until I move on and do something else, um, find what else I like to do. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing now. So what do people think when they know you got a degree from TCU? Um, I mean, really, it's just like, oh, wow. You have a degree. I mean, I'm I'm a first generation college graduate. Um, so a, a lot of people are just like, wow, like that's great that you have a degree. That's mm -hmm. great that you, you know, graduated because a lot of people know how difficult college is. And mm -hmm. not just like the academic side, but like yeah. everything, mental, yeah. everything. Correct. Um but pe when people know that it's from TCU, they're just like, wow you from california went to the south and did that congratulations like just a, a lot of people are just really happy for me and really proud of me so yeah so what would be your advice for the next generation when it comes to issues of race and um just dealing with student life at tcu um don't be complacent at all um because you you can't you can't be in a changing environment and you can't affect change if you're just acting like things don't happen or just you know eating stuff when things happen to you so definitely don't be complacent um if you if you want to do something do it um as much as people say like oh your scholarship may be brought into question or things like that like it's not it's it's not you you literally have to do some crazy ish for them to take like your scholarship away so like don't don't live in fear that things are going to happen to you just if you feel like something needs to happen if you feel like change needs to happen do it go for it and if you need someone to lean on like talk to people like make sure you have support make sure you have people that are gonna have your back and that are gonna really be there for you if shit hits the fan for lack of a better phrase and that are really gonna support you if people are spewing hate at you and you're not used to it or people are just being mean and just all of that just go for it have support and don't be complacent all right well Chanel Alexander thank you so much for sharing your experience at TCU with us um the race and reconciliation oh. initiative appreciate your contributions um and uh you know we'll just spread the word for sure Thank you. Thank you.